situation is we've had a section on meekness, but now we're getting to the place where the uh, instruction is for us to uh, not just admire meekness as a beautiful trait, but to fall in love with it so we personally adopt it as our own. So to cherish it and think of it as beautiful and desirable so that we would want it. And so that's why we're going to go through the different things that meekness will do for us and bless us in. And so it uh, gives us a desire to have it for ourselves. So there's an ornament that ornaments the soul, and meekness is that ornament from God. And so we're going to look in uh, Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, we'll read this in verse, <coughs> excuse me. But ye, this is verse 14. But ye put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill it in its lusts. Um, the, 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 the armor of light against strife, as we, we read here in our notes, the armor of light against strife is to put on Christ. To put on Christ. Notice it says, but ye put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 13 that we're to walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in uh, chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. So how do we do that? Not in strife. How do we keep from having strife in our life? And of course, strife is that contention that happens between everybody. It always happens between a husband and wife, between parents and children, between neighbors, between coworkers. It does happen. And it will happen, and it's unavoidable, because we're human beings. We're going to find that there's some strife sometime, and more strife sometimes than others. So how do we avoid that? According to the scripture, you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an armor against strife. And it's the most beautiful of ornaments for a man's soul. It's the most beautiful of ornaments for a man's soul, to put on Christ. What could you put on more beautiful than Christ? Christ created all things, and he is the perfection of beauty. So to put on Christ is to be like him in your spirit. It's to be like him, and to be like him morally, so that your behaviors reflect his, your spirit reflects his, the things you choose and want reflect him. So he were to put him on. It's a mysterious thing to say, put on Christ. To put on Christ, it is... Um, not just like my jacket that I went and put on and it was a physical thing that I just did that was easy it's done and now I've got you know my jacket on well that's that's easier said than done when it comes to put on Christ it's a more of a mysterious a spiritual matter and so it's a matter of the choosing a matter of the will it's a matter of desiring and choosing that which is better than something else Christ being the most beautiful ornament is to be chosen over the ornament we'd naturally have without him we'd naturally have strife and we naturally, um, uh, 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 I lost the word, uh, we would nat naturally uh, dirty up our relationships through strife and hurt them and, and add uh, a, a lack of uh, salt, if you will, to the, to the environment as we, so the Bible says we're to be salt and light. And when salt loses its flavor, it's not good for anything. So we go and we, we sort of deteriorate our relationships instead of build them up because we're having strife. And that would be avoided if we could put on Christ. All right, so let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. <coughs> and at 1 Peter chapter 5... <coughs> It says, there we go, I got the wrong, wrong chapter. Chapter 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. We're all to submit to one another. This is meekness. How is, it, how is it that your spirit, you know, I mean, you know who you are, you know what your rights are, you know that you've existed in this world long enough to know certain things. How is it that we're going to submit to one another, knowing that we have pride, 
knowing that we have uh, rights, uh, we're going to have to choose to be humble. That is a, uh, it is a beautiful thing in man to be able to submit himself. Um, I, I heard this uh, definition of meekness one time. Uh, someone said that uh, a good uh, word picture of meekness is um, a young boy pulling and uh, walking with a Clydesdale horse behind him holding, holding the reins of that horse as that horse walked behind that boy. Now, of course, a, a Clydesdale could easily not only, you know, walk away, but he could just uh, run right over the child. There's nothing about the child that keeps the horse except the horse chooses to be kept. Uh, he's completely meek. He's not powerless. He's not weak, but he's meek. He could do what he wants, but he chooses to follow that boy because it was the right thing to do. And in meekness, we are going to submit to one another. Now this is a great task for a man to do, to submit to someone else. And, of course, in submitting to one another, that does not mean that you allow one person to become a dictator. You should never have a pastor who tells everybody what to do and expects everybody to listen and is a big boss. That's not a good pastor. A pastor is a spiritual leader, and he should follow here as well, submitting to one another. There is an authority that comes with the pastor, and he does watch for your souls, and he will have to answer for you before God. So there's a, a level of rebuke and ex exhortation and encouragement you should get from him, but it should not be a dictatorship where the pastor expects everybody to follow everything he does without question. We're to submit to one another in love. We should all exhibit this spirit of humility, and it is a beautiful thing. We're all to submit to one another. And how is this to be done? We're to be clothed in humility. To be clothed in humility. We have to decide what we're going to wear. The wearing is either going to be our own pride or the humility of Jesus Christ. We put him on. And so not only are the younger to submit unto the elder, and of course that would be a, 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 a submission that comes so naturally that the younger would submit to the older. That just kind of goes with the, the nature of things. And of course, we don't get that a lot from younger people submitting to older people, even though it's supposed to be like that. That doesn't always happen either, but it is fairly natural. But for us to submit to one another in the spirit of love, that is a very supernatural thing. That does not happen. That's why churches have such big problems, because everybody has their own agenda. See, when, when you, you're dealing with the spirit of Christ, if everyone in the church wants the glory of God first, then there'll be peace and there'll be harmony because they want glory to come to God. The problem in churches is that people all want their own glory, and therefore they're all each individual little kings, and then everybody wants their own way. And then when everybody chooses to get their own way, God's glory is somehow fit in there uh, as a secondary. And, and you know, we'll, work, we'll, we'll do some things I like because that brings glory to God. And instead of being humble and seeking God together as a church and looking for the leading of God, uh, churches run into problems when there's too many... Uh, there are too many chiefs and not enough Indians, as they say. Uh, we need to be careful that we submit to one another in brotherly love, and we, we do that with the spirit of encouraging one another, because the Bible says that the purpose of the church is that to, to bring every man to perfection in Christ. To bring every man to, and that word perfection is a maturity, to bring every man up to the, to the place where he's supposed to be and, and guide him on in that maturity. And so we're perfecting the saints, meaning that we're not doing this for me, we're not doing this for you, we're not doing this for anybody, we're doing it for each other. Church is so that God will get the glory. And what more glory could he get than if we were all clothed with humility? I mean, if you could just, uh, I don't know, it's probably a bad illustration for church, but if you could throw pixie dust across the church and make everybody humble, that'd be a good church. And of course, sorry for that uh, illustration, but the point is, that's not how it works. You have to go before God and choose it. It doesn't work that way, but it sure would be nice to be in that church after everybody's chosen to be humble. But if we could have that individually, then we would be someone to promote it instead of someone to hinder it. And so therefore, we're to clothe, be clothed in humility. Now, we're going on letter E. In meekness, there is lots of different things that are credits to us. Not only is an ornament, a cre oh, not only is it a credit of an ornament, but it is the credit of true courage. True courage. It is far from cowardice. Number one, it is far from cowardice as is thought by the world. 
to the world, meekness is cowardice. Meekness is cowardice. You think of that Clydesdale horse, and the other horses laugh as he's walked through the uh, street by uh, that little boy, and they say, well, you know, we can do as we please, and you can't. Say, yes, but you're wild, and he's not. And that's the difference. He's tamed. He's, he's being used for a purpose by his master. And that is the, per the point of being a, a person. You don't know what it's like to be a person unless you're being used by the master for your purpose. Well, you can't just make up a purpose for your life. You're not God. You can't do that. You can't come up with something that will be better than what God has for you. Therefore, it is not weakness. It's wisdom. It's not a weakness. It's, it's, it's reality. This is who you are and what you're to be. But the world says it's weak because they don't understand it, and they prefer to be their own king and master. The only problem is they, and we all know this, we destroy our lives when we do that. And we can't make our decisions correctly. We can't function right amongst our, our brothers and sisters and our families. And we make choices that destroy our, our, ourselves and others. And that's the result of not being meek. We hurt people. We say things we shouldn't say. We think thoughts we shouldn't think. We um, express things too quickly, and we don't have the time to reflect, and then we have to go back and apologize afterwards, after what we've said has already done damage. And it reminds me of the illustration. I've given this before, but the father wanted to teach his son about that. So he took him up to the top of the church steeple, and they were in there in the bell steeple, and he took, had him bring his pillow. And he said, now son, uh, take your pen knife and cut the pillow. So he cuts the pillow. He says, now, now shake it out. So it's a down pillow. He shakes the pillow, and of course, the feathers go everywhere. And they're all over the yard now, down below. And he says, okay, now son, uh, put them back. He says, dad, I, I can't do that. He says, that's right, son. And that's what your words are like. Once they leave, you can't put them back. The damage is done. And therefore, be careful what you say. And so we see that the world laughs at meekness while we um, who, uh, who have the, the, the grace of God, if we have it, to be meek, save ourselves that kind of trouble. And so let the world laugh, but we won't have to apologize if we are meek. Then number two, the world celebrates anger and revenge as valor, honor, and greatness of spirit. Especially is this seen in the movies and the television. Anger and revenge is the theme of heroicism. Um, yeah, I, I, I got to uh, thinking one time as I was in a discussion with someone and we were talking about the superheroes because I guess as of late, you know, superheroes have always been interesting because they have, you know, special powers and they're a, a fantasy idea of what well, would be pretty exciting to be able to fly, you know, I mean, who hasn't thought of that as a young, young boy? To, what if I could fly? Um, but the thing is, uh, they have these, um, uh, some of these um, uh, heroes, as we call them, really embody things that are wicked. And, and you don't recognize it at first, but as an example, I can remember watching um, you know, Batman. He's a basic character, you know who he's, what we're, we're saying. But his, the motive of his life was to be an Avenger. And he would, he, he had, had, his parents had been killed, and he went out basically seeking the guy who did it. And that's usually how a lot of the storylines are in the movies. You know, you're looking for the, the guy who did it. You know, you're going to go get him. And <clears throat> there's a lot of um, emotions that are stirred up in a story like that. And you want them to go find the guy who did it. And it's not just the police find it. It's the guy who was hurt who gets to inflict the vengeance on the people and the joy that he gets, and I say joy, I mean that loosely, but the pleasure that he gets from inflicting that pain on people or going to get the people who did it, and you begin to enter in into a, a state of um, pleasure and vengeance. And the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It should be our, we should rejoice when a criminal's caught. And we should rejoice when justice is served. But we have to be careful not to enter into someone's vengeance with them and think that that's heroics. Um, we have to be careful. A lot of these movies in the, uh, will, will take you down a road of vengeance <coughs> in your heart and you just follow along. You don't recognize the current you're on. And the method 
of making it entertaining is to stoke the fires of vengeance in your own heart so that you relate, oh, excuse me, you relate to that um, desire to um, get back at people. You know what I'm talking about. You, you, you've been there. And then you have the, um, another illustration of this is when uh, you, you watch a, a romance. We'll get off the heroics and we'll go to the romance. And what will happen is um, the, the lady has got a, a rotten husband. Just a horrible husband. But she, finally she gets rid of him for the real guy that she's supposed to marry. And by the end of the movie, if you follow it, you're like, you get to hate the husband. You think the husband's got to go. She finally gets rid of him and falls in love with the new guy. And that's the end of the story. And, you're, and somehow there's resolution in that. Before you realize that, A, they are married, and you just watch the dis dissolving of, a, of, of something God honors, which is marriage. And then you are rooting for an adulterous relationship before too long, and it gets ugly. We have to be careful how they will take you down a current that's not a stream that God would have you go down. And they use that because they know it works, and that's, it's, it's, it's devious, but it works and it sells, and they make money off of it, so what are you going to do? That's, uh, we have to be careful. But the point is, how did I get off on that? Oh, anger and revenge is celebrated as valor. Whereas anger and revenge in the scriptures is something that we are to give to God and then uh, and then have meekness in its place. Number three says, true courage allows a man rather to suffer than to sin. Rather to suffer than to sin. Now that is not what you're going to um, see much of in the world, to be encouraged that you would rather suffer an injustice than sin. Don't sin against God because your rights have been infringed upon. It's not that we ought not to stand up for our rights. We ought to stand up especially for the rights of our common man. And when we speak of meekness, what we need to recognize as well is that there is a... <clears throat> There's a right that God will watch over for you, your personal rights. For instance, I have a right to be respected. Yeah, yeah, we all say that, and I, I say that as a, as a person. We have a right to have respect from people. I mean, people ought not to just talk down to us and, and, and be condescending to us and speak uh, nasty to us because of our, our place in life. But we have a right to personal property. And if my neighbor would come and steal my stuff, I can defend my right in the sense of my right to be respected, or I can defend my right of personal property. One affects you. Your personal property is at stake. If my neighbor can steal mine, then your neighbor can steal yours. So I'm recognizing that there are things that ought to be protected, and God has told us that thou shalt not steal, meaning he believes in private property. And we should protect that which is our neighbors and the rights of man. So meekness does not involve you giving up the rights that would affect somebody else's ability to, to live and to have, have um, their own personal property and their own rights. But it does not include, meekness means that you're not having to protect your rights in the sense of, you have to respect me. You won't talk to me that way. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to be talked to down. I'm not going to be talked down to. It would rather be gentle and peaceable than to start a fight or to encourage a fight or to throw fire back to fire to make it worse. And so meekness allows you to know the difference as well between your right as just a person and our rights as people. God would not be for us yielding up all of our rights so that uh, others would not be able to have peace in society. So we have to be careful when we speak of that kind of thing, not to, to, uh, to be able to distinguish between the rights of people and the rights of us as individuals to have our own selves respected. So true courage allows a man rather to suffer than to sin. He would rather reject a challenge than run headlong into sin in the name of bravery or dignity. You know what I'm talking about. Running headlong into a challenge. And, and as, as men, we, we, can't, we have a hard time being challenged. Um, uh, I remember me and Chris were moving the chairs over at uh, Emmanuel at the church and, and uh, he picked up three chairs so I picked up three chairs and then 
I think this is for Sophie's birthday party. And then he picked, I remembered it when we were moving chairs last week. And then he picked up four chairs, and I was like, oh, I picked up five chairs. So he picked up six chairs, and I picked up seven chairs. It didn't matter how many chairs he picked up, I couldn't let that stand. So uh, we were laughing about that. I had chairs on the leg, and you know, trying to hop, and it was, I would, neither of us wanted to be outdone. But as men, we can't hardly take a challenge. We have to at least address it. But do we, is it necessary, in the name of bravery and dignity, to run headlong into sin? To run headlong into sin. Be careful not to run into sin. You would rather choose affliction than iniquity. Rather choose affliction than iniquity. It would be um, dangerous for us to leave God behind so that we can get into a fight. I would rather have God than the fight. And if I'm going to be in a fight, I want him with me. I want to be able to say, God help me when I'm in this fight. Whether it's a fight of words, whether it's a fight for my life, I don't want to start it and not have God with me. Number four, the man who can bear the taunts of the world, he can bear the taunts of the world as he's called a coward for denying the brutal lust of anger, choosing rather to follow the royal law of love, will find God's blessing. It says in Judges 6.12, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon was a mighty man of valor, as he was a, a, a man of meekness. He was called a coward by some, but he was meek. And it's evidenced by the way he dealt with Ephraim, if you read the passage in Judges, that he was a meek man. And, <coughs> excuse me, he chose the royal law of love, and he found blessing. There is anger the temptation to anger in the heart of every man, and we ought to be careful not to give in to it. The giving in to anger results in letting loose a fire that may not be able to be controlled, and you'll burn people. And people are very tender and sensitive, and we'll answer for how we speak and the words that we say. If we'll be answering for our idle words that the Bible, you know, Jesus told us, we'll answer for every idle word, how much more for every intentional word that we've said in anger that we said in haste, that we said before we were um, had really thought through the very words and what the meaning is of them. How many times have you said something and you've had to say this, well, I didn't really mean that. I, I didn't mean it that way. And you did say it, and in your heart you meant it, but upon reflection, what you mean is, I don't want to have meant it that way. I mean, it sounded bad, but I really don't feel that way as I step out of my anger and back into the cool, calm, and collected me, that's not how I feel. That's how I feel when I was angry. We don't have to be there. We can be meek. And then we don't have to make that apology. But if we do, hopefully people will forgive us. But in the meantime, um, be careful. So let's, um, I'll say this last one. I, I hate saving, I keep saving one more for them, but I don't want to go over. So let's just go ahead and close with prayer, and then we'll do this next time. I don't want to rush.